Welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast, where we address the challenges and the opportunities of midlife from a uniquely Catholic perspective. This is the time, my friends, for a deeper renewal of your Christian vocation. Come and enter into the freedom of Christ that allows you to be the person you were created to be, because there's an amazing, awesome, exciting next season of life waiting for you. Hello and welcome to the Catholic Midlife Podcast. This is Curtis. It's great to be here with you today. I'm here with the lovely Karen. Hello. Hi, everybody. And how is your week going? What's been up with you this week? Oh, well, that's the $100 million question, Curtis. (laughs) Because after our last episode, you have completely distracted me this week. And I'm distracted from my projects. And instead, I'm reading Ian McGilchrist. Yes. So... Thank you, I think, because he's completely fascinating. And I'm not so sure because it's definitely been a distraction. Well, and there's so much to it. Yeah. And articulating this, it's it's a little slippery. Well, I did the thing that I always do that makes you crazy, Curtis. I skipped to the last chapter and read it first. (laughs) Oh, yes, of course. (laughs) Because I wanted to get kind of the main points in my brain. And it is... It's really fascinating. So can I just tell you a couple things that I know? Yeah, from let's my just stream of consciousness. Bring it on. Okay. Well, I, I started to appreciate that part of what Ian McGilchrist is saying is in the West, we have really let the left hemisphere just take control and run away with our culture and with our priorities and with our perspective And partly how he says this is by contrasting it with the Eastern Asian cultures who are still very much grounded in the mastery of the right hemisphere. Would you say that's accurate, what I'm saying? Well, it's not just technology. It's not just democracy. It's not just how many things have happened in the last 200 years that have shifted our perspective. It is influences are much more profound. And so comparing what's going on in the West with other cultures, I think that could be a good approach. Right, right. Well, one of the things he says is you can tell which hemisphere is in charge because you can look at how a people or a culture relates to nature. And are they are they treating the natural world like a material to be shaped and used and grasped and controlled? Or do they see the natural world as its own kind of interconnected being, even in a spiritual or religious sense, and relating to it out of that interconnectedness? The left hemisphere has no appreciation for the living, for the animate. It is very mechanistically oriented. Okay. Remember how the stroke patients would view, they ask people how how does the, a body work? And they draw these strange machines. Huh. There's no concept of the living. So that's one of the hallmarks. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So the other thing that he was saying is that w- when your right brain is is working well and kind of in charge, then you have a sense of being able to appreciate contradictions and coming to synthesis and looking at things from different points of view and that there's value in things as a process rather than just some kind of immutable reality. And so he's saying stuff like, well, in the West, we think that what's valuable is this immutable thing, like a static state of being, and and you're trying to get there and get that versus life as really a process of becoming and with lots of variables and really the journey and the process being extremely important. So the pragmatic West, it wants the answer. It wants the algorithm. It wants the steps, the rules to follow to get the outcome. And none of this messing around with journey. Did you, we don't use the word journey around here, <laughs> not in the West. It's true. It's true. And the other thing that struck me was he was saying, like, 
you know, in the West, we have all these recording apparatuses. And it just made me think of like all of our ongoing or approach that, well, instead of having the experience, we need to capture the experience and put it on Instagram or put it on TikTok. And so we're we're spending all our time in whatever we're doing, kind of capturing it to to present it to somebody versus actually having the experience. That's another big theme. Really? The right hemisphere perceives directly. It has the experience. The left hemisphere takes the information and it boils it down to concepts and it represents the information oh. so that it can manipulate it in a, a powerful way. So representation is a hallmark of a left hemisphere dominant approach. And so, yes, the need to put it on Facebook so that it's actually been experienced or to do all this stuff. It's yeah, that's a left hemisphere thing. Aha. Yes. Another reason to hate social media. Yeah. I, I feel There's vindicated. So <laughs> <laughs> I feel vindicated. So can I share with you one little study? I mean, I really only read half a chapter, okay? But it's so interesting that there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, what what do you got? (laughs) Well, Miguel Chris was saying that, you know, there was a study that basically demonstrated that East Asians would have a much more holistic approach to understanding reality. Like, for example, if they were asked to group some objects, they wouldn't use categories a lot. They would just pay attention to, like, family resemblances and relationships or changes. So they're looking at the whole, whereas Westerners would give kind of rule-based responses, like looking at individual components of the stimuli and then trying to make sure they had them in proper categories. Whereas the East Asians would have use a lot more intuition in recognizing how things are interconnected and related. And I just found that to be fascinating. And I'm starting to see why it's problematic to lose that sense of holistic, intuitive understanding of reality. Also, I think that this is starting to help me appreciate why so many Westerners are now becoming interested in Asian spiritualities because obviously are noticing that there's this big hole or lack in the Western cultural conception of reality. It's really such a shame that people have to look to the East to find some spiritual thinking. Yet we, in our beautiful Christian faith, we talk about spiritual this and that and prayer and all all this stuff, yet we so often are just following the rules to get the outcome. We are putting in the work to, to get the reward. We are separating ourselves from the story, from the sweep of salvation history, from the personal day-to-day reality of, of seeing God's presence, powerful providence everywhere and acting in us and through us, through other people and through nature that's a embodied way of living spiritually in contrast to a, a very mental kind of approach. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it kind of does. Like kind of like we were saying earlier, are you are you trying to stand outside and capture the reality so you can have it and and get the result? Or are you in the story living it, which is a lot more complex and and difficult to grasp and filled with a lot more nuance? and and relationship. And so this is totally making sense to me. And I wonder if, because we've talked about this in the past, about how sometimes our culture can seep in so deeply that really we're responding to our faith out of those cultural impetus instead of what it really offers to us. Yeah, we're living out the values of our culture more than the values of our faith. And right now we're talking about the living, the embodiment, the presence, the relationship, the being with God in contrast to 
doing the things that are supposed to get us the results. Sure, sure. So am I coming to my faith primarily with my right hemisphere <laughs> or am yeah. I coming to it with my left hemisphere trying to grasp and understand it so that I can hold on to it? So my friends, we're talking about Ian McGilchrist who wrote his masterwork, The Matter with Things. Then in the early 90s, he wrote his book, the Master and the Emissary. And it's and all that's the one I've been reading, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly. Okay. And it, and it's all about the differences in the hemispheres, how we get each one gives us its own take on the universe. And there can be some competition between these views. And he sees this hemispheric dividedness playing out in individuals and in groups and entire cultures. And the left hemispheric view it's using the machine model made up of isolated parts that's what it sees the parts they're cogs they they operate by stimulus and response and, and this is often the image through which we make and understand our world like all of medicine is mechanistic in yeah its and nature. i think a lot of people have problems with that because you go to the doctor and you go to lots of doctors and nobody's taking the whole into account. Nobody's saying, let's take a holistic approach here to all of this person and all of the factors and influences that are going on. And that mechanistic or machine-based approach, it's in contrast to what we know, what we know so well is that the most fundamental truths, these are as real as the material. But, but they're not expressible in words and logic. That's the tools of the left hand. These fundamental truths, they can only be accepted and experienced. Love, beauty, awe, the sacred, the presence of God. These are things we experience directly. And so his argument is that healthy individuals, groups, and societies, they approach the world via the right hemisphere, and they react there to what is found, and they have an impression of how it all links up, and then the left hemisphere that dives down, it looks in detail at the elements that we can work on, that we can isolate and, and break down, and then we take those results back and we integrate it back to have a more profound understanding. In contrast, then, in unhealthy individuals and groups, we're looking for the algorithms that have the rules to follow to get specific results. For instance, we're looking to the material world for outcomes like health and wealth. That's how we're organizing our societies. We're not organizing them according to transcendent values. We have these utilitarian kind of material-based values isolation and manipulation of nature and of reality. That's kind of our, our main approach. And soon we're in this own or in our own feedback loop. We, we don't acknowledge those transcendent things, which, which can be embraced, but they can't be grasped. They can't be grabbed. They can't, you can't get your hands on them. They, they simply have to be accepted. So, so one question that keeps coming up for me is, well, what are the signs perhaps that I've given into left hemisphere runaway instead of this more balanced approach that you're talking about where the right hemisphere is the master and the left is the emissary, which has a very important role, but is not to be given the say, as it were. Well, one sign is when you're not able to engage the transcendent as a, a centerpiece of what you're doing. So in art, for instance, the left hemisphere, it, it can't grasp beauty. It doesn't understand it. And so it declares war on beauty. Hmm. And you see this in art because it doesn't understand it. It's going to deny its existence. It's going to denigrate it and try to destroy it. And I'm not sure that McGilchrist tells us exactly when your left hemisphere is taking over. Yet, when we are 
not able to embrace the transcendent, I think that that's a pretty good sign. So for instance, when I'm doing something and I can't find the meaning or value in it, it it's because I'm not connecting back to the whole of reality. Oh, that's a good one. And the one that's coming to me, I think, as you're talking is this desire to control and have things in a work in a certain linear fashion. And maybe like if I have an uncomfortability with contradiction or holding opposite things together and wrestling with ambiguity and nuance, like sometimes that makes us really uncomfortable. We don't like it because we're looking for that control. But it seems to me that that's a way of living in the right hemisphere, which is looking to synthesize and and bring things together. And when we have that discomfort, we go, we look for somebody with the rules or the process. To tell us what to do. To tell us what to do. Ah, yes. So following the rules, one way this shows up is kind of a a political or religious fundamentalism or politics that's actually religion. This idea that if we do certain things, we're going get, to gonna get certain results, like this is the way to do it. For instance, we can lapse into this with our religious practices. It's very easy for me to think that, well, I'm, I'm doing the prayer, I'm doing the sacraments, I've got it all plugged in, and so, yeah, I'm going to get the result. That's my left hemisphere expectation. And it's great to have things to help us, yet that is not the story that's not the relationship uh, that is simply a process sure so when we're breaking it down into some kind of i I don't know like algorithm you're really losing the meaning behind the whole process and the whole story this is this is resonating with me and it also the thing i think that you mentioned maybe last week is that the left hemisphere wants to divide and categorize and it it tends to be very like either or and want to defend its position like i just see that culturally that people are moving towards this inability to reconcile different positions and then it's like staking a claim and then having to defend it to the last yeah it, it's it's making a lot of sense to me. Yeah, get it, getting locked in, and this is the left hemisphere. It it tends to make up its own facts. It gets angry when it's confronted with some contradictions, and it's going to keep interpreting. It's going to see what it wants to see. Now there is a the left hemisphere. It does like the either or thinking, and but so often in real life, there's a distinction. And a paradox, but but there's not a conflict with reality. So, for instance, a magnet. There's a North Pole and there's a South Pole. And they're different. Yet, when you cut the magnet in half, you still have a North Pole and a South Pole. They ah. exist together. And you look at things like justice and mercy. Often, these are approached as different concepts. Yet, they're parts of the same whole. There's no conflict in between them. And the fact that we can't make rules about when to do which and for what reason doesn't mean that they're in contradiction or even in tension with each other. And by the way, I want to make this clear. We are big, big fans of Western culture. (laughs) We appreciate the goodness it has brought to the world. And it's a concern that we, I think we all share. We see these cultural yeah. trends. We see the anxiety, yeah. the stress, the isolation, the young people with all these problems and crazy ideas sweeping through there. Yeah. They're getting into this very black and white thinking. They've got a checklist of crises that have to be resolved so they can get on living, I don't know, the hedonistic Western life that we all desperately love so much, I guess. Well, there's, and again, I haven't read McGilchrist's sort of overview of history and how this all plays out, but it seems to me that that really it's not that the the things that the Western culture is bringing 
are invalid. It's just that they need to be seen in context and in connection with our sense of the whole. And so I, I just really, I'm, I'm really appreciating the problem. I mean, does he give a, any examples of what can be done to reintegrate the perspectives of reality that are becoming divergent? I'm not sure that he has a recipe. Kara and I have I've watched any number of his interviews. And in some ways, he simply wants to resist left hemispheric tyranny yeah. and restore concepts to the conversation like beauty or goodness. Societies differ a lot on what what is good, yet they all have a sense of, hey, what is good here to do? So there is a, at least there's a concept of goodness. Yeah. So yeah. with the free speech, he's very in favor of that. He says, our ancestors shed a lot of blood to have free speech. And then we look over in the old Soviet Union where people were afraid to speak out against the state and they descended into this, this kind of chaotic hell. And that's left hemispheric tyranny. Another point, and this will be familiar to Catholics and religious people, is the idea that unlimited freedom is, is this summum bonum because the left hemisphere wants to seek, grasp, manipulate, exploit. The idea that nature is something for us to use up and discard is a left hemispheric idea. And so there's these movements in our culture that you know they want to remove the obstacles to having as much freedom and power over your body, getting all the surgeries you want, getting all the drugs, just to, just so you can, you know, kind of do the things you want to do to have control and power instead of stepping back and embracing some of the transcendent values of gender, of embodiment, of living and dying. Well, I, I think sometimes a lot of progress can be made just by pointing out the issue and trying to raise awareness around the issue. I do get a little frustrated when I can't get my left brain answer to, well, then what are we supposed to do <laughs> to fix the whole thing? I, I am a little left brain, as you know, Curtis. I I'll just admit that here before everybody. <laughs> so I do have this natural tendency to be like, well, well, gee, what's the answer? What's the solution? Whereas I'm guessing what McGilchrist would say, well, you got to get out there and get in the story and be part of the process and and do the work to create the solutions that you discover along the way. I mean, do you think he might say that? I'm not sure, Karen. I think one of the takeaways that I get from these studies are that the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, they both have a take on reality. And the fact that transcendent values can't be reduced to, to facts doesn't make them less real. Yeah. And I'm really embracing the idea that seeing is believing, by which I mean perceiving, having the experience, is just as much a, an input from the real world as experiencing something that we would call, say, more tangible. Well, one of the things that did struck me from this half a chapter I read is is that he said the the right hemisphere is the one that can believe. And the left hemisphere is the one that wants to know and it can't believe, but it thinks it knows immutably and it doesn't because until that's integrated into the sphere of connectedness and relationship and belief, it can't it can't really know fully. And that really struck me. And I, I do, I, I think this is when we're living the fullness of the story and of the Christian faith, that that's all true about how we are in the midst of it. And it's almost like Christianity has the possibility and potential to pull us back into living and engaging with the story in a powerful way. Wow, that's a lot, Karen. What, so are just my musings of the moment, sorry. <laughs> so what encouragement do you have for our listeners? Well, I think, 
I think my encouragement would be to sit with some of these ideas. And if there's a couple things we've said that struck you to to ponder those a little bit, if you if you're up for the challenge, by all means, find McGilchrist on YouTube. He's got a lot of stuff on YouTube, I think. Ian, Mil- Ian McGilchrist, The Matter With Things. And yeah, he's got a lot of material, a lot of very interesting interviews. There's one with John Cleese, the comedian, oh. which is very cerebral. Oh, I'm going to look that one up. That sounds amazing. And and just to maybe I'll offer a question, which is when you're feeling disconnected, isolated, grasping, wanting to control, maybe there's a question around what am I losing connection with? Where am I seeing something out of context? What are the relationships that I need to consider so I can have a, a whole perspective on this? I think that I'm going to carry that question with me. Yeah, that's a take on reality, but is that really the reality? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for bearing with us, everyone. We obviously are very intrigued with this idea, and thanks for letting us share it with you. We'll see you next week. Thanks for being here with us. The Catholic Midlife Podcast is for anyone that wants to receive the abundance of life that God has for each one of us. Take a moment right now to tell a friend about us.